Good afternoon. Thank you all so much for joining us this afternoon at the Richmond Arts Center for this wonderful talk with Don Farnsworth. For scores of artists, Don Farnsworth is a genie let out of the bottle to take their wishes far beyond their own imaginations. As director of Magnolia Editions in Oakland, Farnsworth has developed techniques which have revived and expanded the possibilities of traditional processes, including photogravure and tapestry, affording artists new vocabularies for their work. The varied digital printing possibilities which have opened for the artists working with Magnolia have enriched projects and stimulated artists from across the country. As an artist himself, Don Farnsworth is engaged with appropriation and collaboration. Indeed, at times in collaboration with his wife, Ira, at times with Rembrandt, or at times with the Federal Reserve, even though they don't know it yet. <laughs> Farnsworth's work is fueled by experimentation and a fearless passion for technical innovation. But, in the beginning of this story, there was paper, and there was printing. And yes, then there was Joan Brown. And working with someone can be a revelation, a revelation of artist, of intent, and tone. Please join me in welcoming Don Farnsworth as he reveals Printing with Joan Brown. try and make this app work so I can show you some slides. Does anybody have direct contact? How many people here had direct contact with Joan? Great. Please um, help me out in this talk and let me know what you know about any subject we talk about to touch on. Just say, hey, Don. It's kind of like, hey, you know, hey, Siri, that sort of thing. <laughs> I can't believe I did that. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> Never mind. Okay. Hey, Don works better. Joan was a spiritual leader. Uh, it's going to be hard to give this talk and not choke up. She was amazing and fantastic to work with. Um, but let's give you some backstory. I started in 1958, um, and I wasn't very pleased with my art ability. Um, and, and I struggled with that for a long time. Uh, and by 1984, I was making paper pulp for uh, Manuel Neri, um, Joan Brown's first husband, as well as uh, Bella Feldman and Katie Cassida, Nancy Ginn. Harold Paris, and then handmade paper for Editions Press, Gemini, and Crown Point Press. Meanwhile, Joan had come out of hiding. You see, um, the pressure of her early success, she dropped out of the art world in the 60s, and she returned in 1974, according to Stephen Schwartz here, um, at, with a show at the University Art Museum at Berkeley. The same year, she joined the Berkeley staff, the faculty, and it's at the staff, I was a squeak she also was Squeak's champion to teach at Berkeley. And, um, and Squeak was my champion, as George Miyazaki was to teach at Berkeley. But meanwhile, back to handmade paper. Klaus Oldenburg, I made paper for Klaus Oldenburg for Crown Point Press with his watermark in it. Uh, made paper also for Chris Burden uh, back in the 70s. And, um, and uh, John Cage, Crown Point Press. And I moved, uh, I worked at Editions Press as a printer from 74 to 79, built a paper mill in Africa, came back and started a press at Peter Volkus's dome. Are you familiar with his big dome-like studio in, uh, on the Oakland-Berkeley border? And that was a good time. Pete was amazing, fantastic. You could choke up talking about Pete as well. And he was a good friend of Jones. While we were at the Dome, we worked with this artist, Judy Chicago, on the birth project, where we made handmade paper. The handmade paper mill was in Kensington, and so we commuted back and forth between making paper in Kensington and working with Joan, uh, Judy Chicago, rather, on the birth project. Uh, and uh, it was a big piece of paper. We had to figure out how to do an, a, a connected uh, 
uh, connected litho, uh, paper pulp, and text, and gold leaf. And also, while at the Dome, we worked with, uh, I worked on a few projects with Wayne Thiebaud. Met George Miyasaki. Then we ripped a big hole in the dome wall, in the, in the dome building, to move our printing press out of the dome and over to um, Magnolia Street. And we set up Arne Hirsu's press and my press together and started Magnolia Editions. Arne Hirsu, who also uh, started um, North Face at one point, but he died a year into Magnolia of a brain tumor. So it was just David Kimball, the paper making, and myself. Meanwhile, Joan was making prints at Gemini. Beautiful prints that are in this show. That's Donald, the adolescent cat, and Layla. Fantastic color lithographs, I, I really like. I called Cameron and I said, hey, do you have some photographs of, of working with Joan on those prints? And they looked and they looked and they said no. So I was very pleased to go through my slides and find these slides, which I'm gonna show you. Took a lot of time to restore them. There's been a lot of restoration going on here. Um, the woodcut is locked in here uh, for the blue run, but let's talk about this print for a little while. It's um, a woodcut and a lithograph, and it shows Joan um, swimming, uh, but uh, let me set the stage for you a little bit more. So I was told by Joan's dealer, don't make an appointment directly with Joan. Call me if, when you want her to come to the studio. She's very, very busy. So I stopped her in the hallway at Berkeley where we both taught and I said, Joan, is it true? I, I have to call your dealer in order to make an appointment for you to come to Magnolia? Oh no. I just when, when you want me. So, well, can you come Thursday? Sure. Not only did she come on Thursday, she brought lunch for the whole crew. Not only that, but Joan, look at that smile. <laughs> this is not easy. Um, she carried sandwiches in her pockets for the homeless. She's an avid swimmer, as I think most of you know. Um, and that's her with Che DeFeo. And t take a look at that photo from 78 of the, li of the Lime Rock swim, and there she is in the, in the, in the, um, in the print. I was going to say in the woodcut part of the print, but in fact, it's litho. Even this area has lithography as well as woodcut. <laughs> Well, Joan was so busy, according to her dealer, and yet when she came to Magnolia, she was all involved and working her, her she was a hard working, like Judy Chicago, like all the artists we work with, so many of them, Guy Deal, who's here today, my wife, Ira, uh, Dorothy Lenahan, Susan, all these artists are so hard working, the successful ones anyway. Um, so in order to do, this is a reduction woodcut, so this is some technical stuff I just like to get past. This piece of wood that printed the orange is the same piece of wood that printed the red. So basically, we print the orange, and Rick Dula is the master printer at this point. Rick Dula and, uh, took uh, a tracing uh, and traced onto the wood the area that had to be carved out with Joan and carved out the bridge and carved out the body. So the body stayed orange, the boat and the head I think turned red, I think, let's see. And then meanwhile, we're printing. And while I'm uh, loading and unloading paper on this flatbed transfer press, this monster of a press, like uh, seven tons, and the head that moves back and forth is uh, two tons, Joan is, is coming and, and uh, sneaking by me and grabbing a print to go gold leaf with. So there she is. And here is just, I, I want to give you, we don't have speakers for this. But it's 10 times louder than what you hear. Here we are printing, this is a, a, a later printing press of the same sort that we bought later. And this is lithography where it has to be sponged. And so while Joan's doing that meditative gold leafing, 
this racket is going on and she's sneaking by this two ton thing that's moving back and forth inches from her. And, um, and there's Rick Dula and Sarah Rainey. I called Rick to ask him if, what he remembered too. Uh, and there's Joan, she's got a print. She sneaks by. She goes over to the only clean surface at Magnolia. We generally only have one clean surface at a time. <laughs> and she reaches over and grabs a speck of gold leaf or a piece of gold and she carefully places it onto the boat and takes a Japanese brush, a flat-headed Japanese brush and tamps the gold onto the wet ink. So it has to be done. We couldn't say come back tomorrow and do it. It was to be done while the printing was happening so the ink was wet. Now you don't want to get, let the gold blow onto other parts of the print or you get the gold leaf permanently attached to everything. So to do the, the water, um, we had this idea to sandblast the wood. To, well, we had a lot of ideas. We thought maybe we could just moisten the wood with water, and we tried that. That didn't work. You know, that would pull up the grain. Uh, we wound up going around the corner, uh, putting the piece of wood in the, in the dirt, and the guy sandblasted it right there. We brought it back, and it was, just happened to be the perfect piece of wood uh, f for the grain, for the water, for Joan to swim in. And to swim in and to look at the headlands, at the shadow that the Golden Gate Bridge cast on the headlands with what I always thought was her birthmark. But on further research, she was born on the cusp, if you look at the Chinese calendar, of the ox and the tiger. And that's, of course, the lamb and the lion, um, which is, you know, peace, speaking of peace. So I think it all adds up. It's part of Joan's spirituality and... Um, and I think we can all interpret it how we like, but at the, I could have sworn at the time she told me that was her birthmark, but it's not. She's Aquarius, hence the water might be her birthmark. Um, she, uh, two years before Magnolia, she came to Magnolia to make that print, she uh, visited uh, Copland uh, in, in the, a Mayan site in Honduras, and you can see where she got her influence for the, the zigzag up here, and of course, for the uh, jaguars that are in the border. And those are 100% litho. The borders, the top and bottom border, have no woodcut in them. Uh, but if we look closely, we can see that, yes, this is all uh, drawn on an overlay that we made into an aluminum plate. So it was an aluminum plate lithograph here, and then we registered the black here, uh, the eye, uh, et cetera. I think the eye was painted in by hand, I'm not sure. And that's, it was printed like this, you know, with a sponge, like you saw in the movie. But, and she, like I said earlier, she was very important to Squeak Conrath, who we're all going to go see later today and saw last night. I asked Squeak if she could tell me something. Well, she said, oh, Joan was so important for me teaching at Berkeley. And then from Berkeley, she went to Davis and invited me. I got to teach, actually, with Squeak and Davis with Wayne Tebow. At Berkeley, when I was teaching there, we would never go out to lunch together because all the art faculty seemed, from my point of view, to hate each other and wanted to stab each other. But when I got to, to Davis and I was teaching there, one day, uh, I think Arneson said, hey, let's go to lunch. We were also working with Arneson at the time. Let's go to lunch. Yeah, sure. I thought he meant just him and me go to lunch. We were doing prints with Arneson. He meant everybody, Wayne Tebow, Hendrix, the whole art department. I said, the whole, we're all going to lunch together? Yeah. I go, whoa, in my mind, that would never happen at Berkeley. <laughs> that was quite exciting. That's, uh, uh, by the way, uh, Rupert Garcia, who we also were. And the print we made in the same year of Jones with Squeak was this hand in light, which we also did in handmade paper with paper pulp. Still expanding, and we still work with Squeak to this day. She's fantastic. We love, we love all the artists we work with, and Squeak's one of them, and she's fantastic. And we do tapestries, too. And in the same year, uh, Scott Bell, who we met through the Dome, he was a part owner with Pete in the Dome uh, studio. We did woodcuts with, with uh, him, and later William Wiley, uh, Hung Lu, a powerful, uh, force in the Bay Area, uh, uh, woodcuts with her, and Richard Wagner, 
Guy Deal, who's here in the front row right there, second guy over from the left if you're facing the stage. <laughs> and uh, you can ask him questions too. Um, and Mel Ramos, uh, I should have used, we also did Wonder Woman, I should have put that up instead of Superman. Um, and we do it a different way. So instead of hand carving as much, these days we rely more on a giant laser cutter to cut the wood. It's, uh, it's easier and it's pretty accurate. And we're not printing on a flatbed press. We got rid of both flatbed presses. It's all over for flatbed presses. That's a, um, as the guy uh, who took the press away said, when I, so much equipment, so many chemicals, so much technology, turn of the century, uh, industrial revolution technology, he said, I said, man, look at all this stuff. And he said, if you want to play, you've got to pay. And it was a rich man, uh, it's a rich man's game is what he was saying for lithography. It's, it's a terribly expensive. Anyway, etching is fantastic and we can do so many great things. And we have new style printing presses now where the Mildred Howard, very experimental things, printing on metal and canvas and paper and acrylic. We can print under the acrylic now and we can go crazy with Deborah Arpaolo also printing on wood and doing some really incredible experimental things using a four by five by eight foot flatbed acrylic printer with UV cured lights. You can pour methyl ethyl ketone on this stuff and we wanted to dissolve these, salt, these paints so we could mess with them as artists will want to do in general. We, there is no solvent that will break the cross-linked polymers of acrylic. Now acrylic, it's easy to dissolve acrylic you buy in the art store, but this kind of acrylic, this acrylate, which is UV cured, forget it. There's no solvent. So it's very permanent and it's the same, it's the same uh, paint used for, a uh, pigment used to paint cars. So it lasts in direct sunlight, direct sunlight for three to 10 years. So it's pretty amazing stuff. Now there's this Bruce Connor connection. I worked with Bruce Connor and there's this Bruce Connor connection with, um, Joan as well. Rat Bastard Protective Association and Bruce named himself as the president and it had these artists in it uh, including Joan Brown, Bruce Connor, Gene Connor, Jay DeFeo and he Wally Hedrick, Wally and Manuel Neri and Michael McClure. And this was back in the 50s when I was still um, uh, doing that finger painting stuff. Uh, Yes, he did the Rat Bastard thing way long time ago in San Francisco. Joan was born in San Francisco. And um, this Rat Bastard Association is very intriguing because from time to time it would come up with Bruce. And you know, I'm so sort of out of it. Uh, I, I, not, I didn't have the, I didn't know what he was talking about, but many, maybe some of you know about the Rat Bastard uh, uh, Protective Association to protect this group of artists because they are, after all, on the West Coast and felt they needed protection in those days. Well, Joan, one of the stories that Rick told me was Joan had this collector that wanted one of his paint, her paintings. Oh, Joan, I love that piece. I love it. I love that piece. And it's not for sale. I, I love it too, it's, it's, I'm keeping it. Then a, a week later, I love that, please, please sell it to me. No, no, it's not for sale. And then a month later, Joan, I love that, please, please sell it to me. Eventually, he broke Joan down and Joan sold it. And it was on the market three days later for twice the price. So Joan was somewhat, as, as the story went around Magnolia, even when she was there, she was somewhat disillusioned with the art market and was focusing then at the time on um, public art, which uh, are incredibly beautiful pieces. Here's a detail, ceramics. And this one, you'll see this tiger there, lion rather, and we did a print with Joan with three plates, deep embossment, for all the people that worked on her project. So she gave this print, she got it out of the budget for doing that obelisk, and she was such a generous person um, 
that uh, this was a giveaway print that she gave to all the workers. It's a pretty big print too, it's not small. And you can see the embossment, and we did some white on white ones too. This is fantastic. And uh, there's Rick Dula and Joan looking with light passing through it on a light table for some reason, I'm not sure why. And we did this raccoon piece, which was also for a fundraiser in 1989. And then Joan died in 1990. You see the guy jumping into the abyss there. And you see it reminded me of this uh, tombstone from Pestum that I happened to photograph many years ago. The Indian authorities announced that two American members of an ashram both from the Bay Area, were also killed Friday in the accident that claimed the life of renowned San Francisco artist Joan Brown. Bonnie Lynn Minerick, uh, 43, of San Francisco, and Michael Oliver, 25, a Santa Cruz comedian, died with Joan, who was 52, when a concrete turret from the floor above collapsed while they were installing a mosaic obelisk at the Heritage Museum in India. Uh, so I was told by Noel and others that um, they were installing the obelisk while the construction was going on. And it had rained that night, and the, there were building materials that had been put up onto the roof to build the turret. And uh, the weight of that, combined with the weight of the water from the rain, is what caused the collapse. And then Noel said that when he saw, was it Ira, was it photographs of Joan or what, did he actually fly there? I'm, I think he said, I think he did go there. yeah, I think he went there. He said I, he expected grisly, horrible, squishy sort of things to have happened. No, there was an air pocket and it was absolutely collapsed and it just pushed the air out of Joan's lungs which is not great, but I'm just saying, she wasn't really crushed. Uh, anyways, we too got into after Joan, and, we, and Joan was such a supporter of Magnolia. I mean, I thought, I mean, it was amazing to work with Joan, and we were thrilled, and she was supportive of our own works of, as artists, and just like she was of so many at Berkeley, I thought, okay, we made it. I'm going to work with Joan for the rest of my life. Shit happens. But we did uh, also come to Joan's conclusion that public art is a definitely a good thing to learn how to do. With the San Francisco airport, we worked on these projects. That's Mildred Howard's uh, uh, San Francisco airport saltpeter piece. And then this is a, a portion of Hung Lu's piece. Um, that's... Uh, and uh, this is a Claire Rojas, which is, we, we made the molding as well, and the, the whole piece is leaning forward as if it's just you're at home, and there's a, there's a canvas hanging on the wall from, that's cute. And we just finished Louise Bendolph's not that long ago, and recently we just sent out uh, Alice Shaw's beautiful piece. Oh, if you see it, it's a redwood forest with a gold leaf background, fantastic. And this uh, piece for Chuck Close, there's a Hung Lu and uh, um, other, another tapestry from the Chinese artist. Okay. And there it is being installed in the, in the new subway line. And here, Tulula Terrell, she's our master printer along with Nicholas Price. We have a great team of workers. We invented over a period of seven years how to paint seven layers of glaze, I mean, not seven, that's what Chuck said in, in that damn interview, where it's 19 layers of glaze, let me get this right, all different values, getting darker and darker and darker, identified with a spectrophotometer, we totally worked this out over seven years, and we're able to trap each value where we need it to, we hand paint the glaze, but we trap the value specifically where we want it, and fire it, the, the, the entrapment of the acrylic burns off. That's the only way to get rid of that acrylic is to burn it off. And we wind up with um, a three-dimensional surface photographic-y kind of thing. 
which uh, everybody seems to like. Even Hillary liked it there. And Ira, there's Ira. She's in the second row, second one over. Um, but it wasn't delivered very well uh, from California to New York. When they delivered it to the subway, things happen. You never know what's going to happen. But luckily, we pra and then Tallulah had to fly out and go through each one individually. In the end, it worked out great. Magnolia's changed a lot since Joan Brown, uh, since her day. This is uh, now working on a Yoko Ono portrait by Chuck, uh, which is in just coming out of the kiln tomorrow. We're working with Kiki Smith. Those are matrix. She does full-size matrix for the tapestries we do with her. Um, and they're fantastic. I love them. Hung Lu, brand new tapestry just came back a week or two ago. That's where that printing press, that's where John and I were working. She was gold leafing right over there. And that was the big press during that earthquake. Print cabinets fell on top of the press and ink went everywhere. So everything's more nailed down now here at Magnolia. And um, laser cutter, those are the kilns. And the paper mill, we're now researching 16th century paper making. We found the DNA from wool from the Navajo Indians who got the sheep from the conquistadors 500 years ago and they kept the breed pure according to sheep geneticists. And we got a felt maker who's a close friend of the sheep geneticist and registrar for the churro breed. And she made large felts for us. So we are working on how to make 16th century paper. And it has nothing to do with cotton rags. This whole thing about rag paper being cotton is uh, from the arts and crafts movement. Cotton is from the slave trade. Cotton is from the cotton gin. Really wasn't much around in Europe at the time. So anyway, Thank you, Joan. Yeah, thank you, Joan. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you. Um, I, I, I know there are lots of people here who actually um, had contact, and then a lot of us didn't and would have a lot of questions. So if you'd like to ask something of Don, or maybe somebody else in the audience could answer that question if Don doesn't have an answer. OK, that means I get to go first. OK, <laughs> I love that. All right, Don. So I wanted to ask you, because I, I'm really interested in, in um, the whole environment at the time and the way in which um, I mean, I, I have this, you know, this kind of idyllic view of the Fillmore Apartments with Jay DeFeo and Joan and the hole in the wall and the running back and forth and that kind of um, cross-fertilization that was going on. Could you talk a little bit about how that happens in printmaking, in um, how you've seen it between some of these people who are working with you at this, that period of time? Yeah, you certainly see it in your show with... Um with Joan's uh, drawings on paper, and uh, her one of her mentors was, uh, what's his name? Uh, Elmer Bischoff. Elmer Bischoff. Yeah. And you can just so see that collage element. And it's that is a microcosm for exactly how it works. Mm -hmm. An idea lays on top of another idea, lays on top of another idea. And we look uh, often for failures. We're, we're not trying to find our way we're not trying to find our way to, to something immediately. We want to find what doesn't work as much as what does work. And if something doesn't work, maybe something along that tangent will turn out to work. And so at Magnolia, and Guy Deal knows uh, better than any, we have a motto, you know, um, create, nothing stifles creativity more than fear of failure. And that's a John Cleese quote. Um, so when Joan uh, came and we were tossing, we basically were tossing ideas around and trying how to get the grain of the wood up and, and how to get the fine detail in a woodcut. And we wound up combining lithography and uh, woodcut together. And it, it's just a, collabor a collaborative process that extends the, um, the ability of the artist. We were just at Dorothy Lenahan. She's here in the second row next to Ira. 
she's a Dorothy Lenahan Glass Studio. And we just saw, what was the artist's name? Leslie Shows. Leslie. Leslie. Leslie Shows. Mm -hmm. She did this art piece out of glass, which is, and Guy was there, and Squeak was there. Phenomenal piece, unbelievable. And Susan was there, <laughs> a second row, far <laughs> right. This piece was amazing. I mean, it's going to be installed at the airport? Oh, Moscone Center. So you will see it one day. And Dorothy said, well, you know, she just came in and she just worked. You can, I can quote her. She's right here. And I don't think she'll correct me. Dorothy said, you know, I said, why is this, why is it so good? The artist worked her ass off on it. And we see that time and time again. The more the artist puts into it, the better the piece. And in this case, but you need a master glass maker. She doesn't know, she doesn't know anything about glass. Leslie, uh, Dorothy does. <laughs> so, yeah. so, how how did the how did the um, the idea of the wood cut the the wood for the grain how did that even enter the process? Because if she had just been coming from Tamarind, she hadn't been working. Did you see how hands. flat the background cast shadow was of the of the bridge, and how flat the background to that, and how flat the how the cool thing about wood is, unlike lithography, you split the ink film thickness. So you can imagine when you roll on ink onto something, you're transferring half the ink, because everything in this world wants to be in equilibrium. So you're transferring half the ink from the roller onto the surface you're rolling on. Then you put a piece of paper on that, and you're transferring half of that ink off, except etching which is kind of cool, etching gets that pockets of ink, uh, like Durer and whatnot, and engraving. And you moisten the paper, and it goes in, and it picks up a bigger ink film thickness than you would expect. So etching has some advantages. But woodcut, on the other hand, you don't have any water. See, with lithography, you've got that. Not only do you, are you splitting the ink film thickness, so ink film thickness, I mean how much ink you have on the surface when, you're, when all, it's all said and done. The cool thing about those flatbed presses that were going back and forth, you don't have to take the print out. You can leave it there and print again and again. We call it a double drop and a triple drop. And so we could build up, and if you look at the print out there, you say, God, that's a thick layer of ink on there. But flat on flat on flat, the ocean, the water wouldn't have worked out, you know, and we wanted to do it. We're always looking to do something in a new way, and that's how that came about. We suggested it to Joan, and Joan loved it, and we did it, and it worked. But I think we were just lucky. Um, do you know, between the woodcut and the lithography and other details, how many times that particular print went through the press? Like, as a guess. Well, we have the orange and the red. That was one piece of wood. Then we had the blue. That was another piece of wood. And then we had the blue of the litho. Then we had the black of the litho. And I think, actually, we did print the light blue on the eye. And so I believe it was five or six times only. But it might have gone through the press for the orange and the red. I believe it went through twice each. So because that's a double, those were double drops. And then I came along and did a rainbow roll on two of the prints and ruined what would have been two perfectly good prints. I did a rainbow roll, uh, a gradation, uh, so that the red sky went from red to black for some reason. I don't know, it didn't work. So we have failures. Well, I, that, I could that, that's I should, interesting because- should have it, showed you those. Yeah, but it, it brings up the fact that you're working so differently than if you just had one plate and you and you could proof it and you could work on it here with the reduction on the wood block you're sort of that's it well we're second generation uh, printers here I mean uh, from the arts and crafts movement with notwithstanding the arts and crafts movement we have crown point press Gemini editions press and um, and tamarin and so it's like well they not so much Gemini but certainly Crown Point Press and Editions Press, they were what they were. We do lithographs, we do etchings. We don't combine those things, we don't experiment. 
So that was the room for a younger generation, like myself, I'm young. Um, for a younger generation coming up, that was actually our, our foot in the door was to try to do experimental printmaking. Come to think of it. Anyone else? I just I'm, I'm going to keep asking questions until I see a hand go up. So my next question is, was there a kind of daisy chain effect where there was someone you remember who came in and worked and a friend of theirs, another artist came oh. in, saw them working and then came in? Could you talk a little bit about so and so yeah. begat, so and so begat. How do you how do you invite artists? Well, while I was at Editions Press, uh, I did a side project with uh, Bob Bechtel and with uh, Peter Volkus and uh, Sam Chikalian, who was my teacher, who gave me honors at the Art Institute. I'm happy to say, one day, just as a side story, um, does anybody remember Sam Chikalian? Yeah, every other word was fuck, I believe, in his vocabulary. You can beep that out. Um, we had a drawing class at, in that when you walk into the Art Institute, on the right-hand side, there's a big studio, and they had tables all around. And, uh, and uh, I had, uh, had a two drawing teachers at the time. I was 17 when I was at the Art Institute. Uh, when I started, and um, I lied about my age so I could see the naked women uh, in the drawing classes, because it's illegal for a 17-year-old to see that. Not to die in Vietnam, more or less, but to see that, and because uh, I had a high school friend who was a registrar who said, Don, you can't say your age. I go, why not? I said, tell them you're older, which is what I told my wife, too, um, later. But, um, we had put our work up, and for, for Ron Titus, the drawing teacher at the time, I had drawn from the figure and draw it as, uh, drew as, as best I could, you know, re relatively traditional drawing. But for Sam Chikalian, I knew he was weird, so I painted the props and the, uh, and the model's foot, for example, you know, he would bring stuffed animals in. And one day, he had us put all our work up, the whole 40 of us, and so we got about three or four pieces up each, uh, all around the classroom, and he's looking around with his clipboard, and somebody walks, just like through your doorway, somebody walks by, hey you! And the guy stopped, what? Get in here! And some expletives, me? Get in here! And, and Sam would turn red when he did that. And the guy came in, yeah? Do you see anything in this room you like? And the guy goes, what? Could you just look at the pieces on the effing wall and tell us which ones you like? Oh, okay. Uh, I like that one, and that one, and that one. Get the out of here, get out of here, get out of here. And I go, oh, shit, he chose my work, oh no. And then Sam says, whose work is that? <laughs> went, no. What's your name? You got honors. <laughs> whose work is that? And this friend of mine, you got honors. And that's how I got honors at the San Francisco Arts. And later, I worked with Sam, later Sam and I became friends and I worked with him, not because, not because I was his student so much, but because somebody told somebody we had, did this project with Peter Volkus and, 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 and Mel Ramos and different people. It, just, it all just piles up on itself. And then, and then an artist will say, well, I see you did this piece, you know, that would work really well for my work. And then they would come in and you would start. You would start on a whole new line. And the funny thing is when I worked at Editions Press, one time we needed a really talented artist to come in and do some, a, be a chromatist, which was to draw for another artist who couldn't draw very well. And I was, what, when I worked at Editions Press, it was the 70s, so I must have been 12 or 14 years old. And Guy Deal comes in to be the chromatist. And that's when I first met him, when he was, I think, uh, you know, 1977. So we were both, what? In our 20s, in our early 20s, actually. Um, and, and then ever since, now Guy comes to Magnolia every Wednesday and uh, helps uh, uh, on his own work. We're doing an etching with him now uh, that's looking really good. And... Uh, and so once we start working with an artist, it, it just sort of continues. With Chuck Close, it was just, uh, we presented him with an idea for, Chuck Close I went after, I got in, and, and we became very close friends, especially he likes Ira better than he likes me. Um, so it's good to have allies. 
and smart people, surrounded by smart, hardworking, happy people. This is the, the, the goal of life, and Joan was one of those. She was so, she was such a breath of fresh air, so not concerned about the art world and money and all that stuff. She was just there to make art work, and it shows in the work, too. Um, and in fact, pulling back, buying her own works back from, from collectors just to get them out of the art market. She was just incredible. Did I mention that? She was buying her own work back? I did mention that when I first started. She was buying her work to get it out of the, the flow and just going with public art. On Fridays, on Fridays we, we work with anybody. So the door is open on Fridays for the community because we don't want to be a stuck-up art organization that we are. Um, so uh, the artists can pay for that sort of thing and they can use any, the laser, the etching, anything, handmade paper. But on the rest of the week we're doing our projects. And um, so with Chuck Close, with Kiki Smith, um, we make something. If we make something and they like it and they sign it and it becomes an addition or a unique piece, then it becomes property of the artist and Magnolia. And then we go to a dealer and the dealer sells it. The dealer keeps a third. We give a third to the artist and we keep a third. And we pay for all the expenses to do it. The artists pay for nothing, which was always the goal at Magnolia to never charge artists money, except, except on Fridays. And did you go after the artists or did they come to you or both? That's uh, everything, uh, I've, I was born under a lucky star, and uh, everything, uh, everything just happens to me. I never worry about anything, I don't worry about, I never had a lot of money, but then I never, uh, well, I called my mother on the second day of art, the uh, second month of art school, and I said, hey, mom, I need rent for next month, you know, I'm at this San Francisco Art Institute. She goes, why are you calling me? So I had to get a job pretty early. <laughs> Funny she doesn't remember that. Um, so I got a job early in, in, in uh, printing at, at Lee Printing, uh, which, uh, and then switched from different areas of the Art Institute, and uh, was then later worked in paper conservation, got turned on to handmade paper. They told me to take chemistry classes, but the, what was the question? <laughs> did you seek art or did they come? Uh, yeah, I have a really lucky star. There we are at a Chuck Close opening, and Cindy Sherman is there, and I introduced my Kiki Smith is there. She goes, oh, yeah, I saw what you're doing with Chuck. I'd love to work with you. That sort of thing. Um, Did Joe Brown start when you started making prints? Was it started at Magnolia? No, she was. The earlier prints I showed you of the cats were from 1983, and that was at, at uh, Tamarind. I, I have a question about um, Joan and drawing, actually, um, because we have some really wonderful little drawings that she did um, on scraps of paper, ballpoint pen, whatever was at hand. I've seen um, in the Bancroft Library, in the archives, in her archives, drawings that she did just on her deposit slips with her, um, with her, with her, her um, checks, you know, the little deposit slips in the back when you're waiting. She was drawing on those. I mean, drawings on anything and everything. So And her letter so, says she ran out last scrap of paper. <laughs> That's the last scrap of paper I have. Absolutely. That is Michelangelo's story. Yeah. He never had enough paper. He drew on everything. And I just went to, I just gave a, I gave a talk, but more importantly, I listened to talks at the um, Renaissance Society in Chicago, and this guy from Italy took these Michelangelo drawings and writings and he separated the two in Photoshop. And he did it as a um, animation. So you could see, you could see the writing come away from the drawing and see the drawing for the first time, separate from his shopping list. So, so my question is, while she was working with you day after day, was she pulled away from the printing? Was she drawing also? No, she was um, so no taking care behind? of the people around her. She was unpacking her sandwiches from the bag and she was feeding people. She was just this loving, forget about it, loving person. She was unbelievable. 
and and told us this. Then someone else told us the story that she always had a sandwich on her for the homeless. Uh, it wasn't something she told or advertised. Uh, uh, I've heard the story too. I've I mean, it's also. like, and also that she worked in a in a soup kitchen, I think, yeah. regularly. Also, yeah. Yeah. And and Squeak isn't here with us today, but Squeak told me a story about Joan, and that was there was a position at UC Berkeley that was coming up, and um, Joan actually told Squeak that she should apply for it. She encouraged her. She really gave her the support to do that, which she then did and got the position. But that, that, was, that was really extraordinary at that time for um, not just for an artist to help another artist, but for a woman to help another woman in a position like that was really extraordinary and always appreciated by, by um, Squeak and very special. Women are going through a hard time right now. Or, or at least we're finding out about their hard times on with hashtag Me Too or something like that. And it's really sad, so sad. And uh, so I, tr I did, to some extent, try to make this uh, the presentation a little bit to show you, well, there were a lot of artists came through Magnolia who happened to be female. We never thought of it that way. Uh, Guy Deal was telling me uh, Joan Brown gave a talk that he loved because it wasn't about uh, male, female, it was about you're making art, doesn't matter. Uh, on the other hand, just like in any part of our society, men tend to get more for their art than women do financially. But I think that, I hope that that will come into parity someday. Uh, but I hope a lot of things. I think uh, probably when we guns. have parity in museum collections for women's art that would and be nice. for um, yeah. solo and retrospective exhibitions for women in museums, then probably the market will hold also yeah. in society. Yeah. But we love working with everybody. Yeah, I, I want to pass the yeah. mic to Brad. Yeah, John mentioned that I, <clears throat> I was out of grad school in 1976, 1978. I started teaching, well, shortly after that, at Babylon College, and they had a program there where they would invite artists to come and speak. And I had known of Joan's work, but not, not extensively. I'm a realist painter, so I'm, I'm focused, I'm myopic you know, at that point in my life. And um, I was asked, I was in the department teaching a painting class, and Joan was ready to, uh, to talk that day, and I was sitting fairly close. I had my camera with me and I was taking photographs of her. And the one thing that she, she brought to my attention, and I was ready to hear it, was that if you're going to be an artist, be an artist. It doesn't matter whether you're male or female. There's no gender here. You be an artist. You know? And the women's movement was very strong in the 70s. And she was basically saying, it doesn't matter. If you're going to be an artist, be an artist. And that really it opened my mind in the sense that, yeah, it doesn't matter who does this. If it works, there's no gender behind it. You know? And that, that's, I still believe strongly in that. It's a very, very strong um, direction, I think, that if you're going to be an artist, be an artist. Don't worry about the gender. It's going to, be, it's going to affect you in many ways, as Don said, but just do it. Just make I, your I noticed that she also tends to paint her contemporary landscape and her mindscape, and her philosophy scape. So here she is painting the things around her, the people around her, her spirituality around her. Everything was her contemporary landscape, internal and external. And so she, everything she brought to it is uniquely Joan. And I think that's an inspiration as well. I love that. Yeah, and, and that, that unity extends beyond just the, um, the, our temporal world, it really extends in all directions. So Joan very early started looking at um, ancient civilizations and reading and looking at the art from the past, whether it was Egyptian or, um, or Greek, and all these, and, and then um, having that fluidity between time also in terms of influence and, and, and connectivity between all the works. Yeah. One more point. In, in after her lecture, I began to seek out her work, and uh, from that point on, uh, I 
just enjoy it tremendously. It was an opening of a door that I was refusing to go through and um, being so focused. I studied with Bob Bechtel and Richard McLean and Mel Ramos in the 70s, and you know, those were pretty heavy hitters. And, uh, but Jones, I just, after her talk, I understood her work and where it was coming from, and I just went, yeah, you know, I'll, I'll walk a mile to see a Joan Brown, for sure. You know, two miles, three miles. Or to smoke a camel. Yeah. <laughs> Hello. I'd like to find out what inspired her from the Copan in Honduras. That she image? had already gone to, I was reading up on it. She had been to Aztec civilizations, Egyptian. She was completely into going everywhere to seek ancient civilizations and to understand. And it might have been part of her guru. guru. She had a, an Indian guru. Possibly that was an influence. But I certainly, I certainly know Aztec, Mayan, um, Inca, uh, Egyptian. And the very first slide I showed um, was there were all these iconographic uh, things in the background that weren't Mayan because the Mayan thing came later. So it was very interesting that, that it was, like I say, her contemporary landscape. She went to see something, oh, and she, she held on to it inside. And, and then she painted herself in the contemporary world, but with these icons around her. It's really fabulous. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Don. Thank you. Thank you, Don. Thank you so much for um, being with us today so generously. Also, Don and Ira have lent three pieces from their collection that are in the exhibition. They are also reproduced in the beautiful catalog, which um, we have. And uh, thank you all for coming. We hope that if this is the first time you've come to the Richmond Art Center, that we will see you again very soon. We have a mailing list, we have wonderful programs, and we hope that you will join us and become a part of the Richmond Art Center. Thank you. Thank you.